I can go on and on with this because in the Cardinal, they were racist as fuck. And so when I went to the Trayvon meeting fucking organization, they were all staring at me like, oh, yeah, we heard about you. You're the fucking asshole. And then the fucking photographer, who's a goddamn fucking white supremacist who got all my fucking, you know, um, uh, uh, he, he censored all my fucking articles and shit. He's taking pictures and he's welcome. You know, oh, come right on in. Who gives a fuck, right? And it's like, you motherfuckers. Uh, I'll say one more thing. My neighbors in uh, in the West End, they were sitting there, had their dogs, was trained to fucking bark at me. They're yelling at me, fucking treat me like a goddamn piece of shit. And, um, and just, you know, just basically, Angel, oh my God, you have never met a fucking bigger psychopath than this fucking Angel? Yeah, you ain't no fucking Angel, you're a goddamn devil, okay? And I feel sorry for anybody that has to listen to her fucking bullshit because she is going to make them fucking jump off a fucking bridge because she's such a psycho and she has no idea that, you know, she's actually doing this type of shit. I see white women doing the same shit. Um, Terry Shoon is like this, you know, she's just in your face and she doesn't realize that she's an oppressive fucking piece of shit. But she just had to find something wrong with me and so she was like you're a cop you're a cop you're a cop and it was like well i kept on saying no i hate cops and i had a passionate speech about how i dislike cops and how i didn't give a shit and then she was like well i hope it's true well you didn't win you didn't win shit you just treated me like a fucking asshole and in fact i eventually did get robbed so while the dogs were barking at me while they was treating me like a fucking asshole i got fucking jacked and it was probably by their fucking friends. So, oh, that's so fucking awesome. That's so fucking great. I, In some respects, I wish I was a fucking police officer because then I would have had the power to stop them from fucking with me like that. But because I had no power, because I was dependent on my neighbors to give a shit and they didn't give a fuck. They were my fucking enemies. They're pretend Christians. Fuck your Christianity. You love white Jesus, but you don't fucking love me. And it was bullshit. So, this, you know, and then her mother, her mother was kind of like just always mad and angry all the time because she's a king, right? She's a queen, has to control everybody, do this, do this, because I'm a fucking queen, I'm the fucking boss, and I, if I show any emotion, right, that's a boss. If they, they tell you what to do and you gotta do it, but they can't tell you a joke, they can't tell you a story, they can't create culture, they can't do anything. They can't do a, a, a fucking goddamn anything except for, you know, anything else. If they tell you a story, a joke, or anything else, that takes away from their authority. It shows that they're people too and that they sort of want the human connections that we all want, but then they don't, they want the power and they can't let go of that power. So, I, I think that's what, um, I think that's what black women need to do. I think they need to sort of let go of the uh, their willingness or their psychoticness or their you know their will to control other people. They need to stop doing that. They need to stop doing that to their kids. They need to stop hitting their kids. They need to be quit doing, being so shitty to their kids. And I see this with white women too. Um, but they'll start shit with the kids and they'll be like, do this and do that, ha ha ha. And then if the kid was like, you're an asshole, I just sat there and actually watched this. Um, one clip on Ashley uh, Nicole Roper's page about um, um, this one kid who, while they're doing an interview and they're sitting there kind of explaining what had happened on an airplane, there was some sort of incident between the two on the airplane where she like hits the kid and told him to shut up, and he was just sitting there like, I don't deserve that. Why would you do that to me? It's not fair. You treat me like a dog. Why are you doing that? You know, I just barely nudged you, and then you was like, oh, and you just hit me real hard, and then she was like. And then, uh, she's like, you're not the boss of me, you know, I'm not a dog, I'm not an animal. And she's like, I am the boss of you. When I tell you what to do, you do it. When your teacher's at school, white women, 80 to 90%, white women in the schools in the education system, when they tell you what to do, you do it. We have to be fucking bitches to fucking other people. We gotta be, I guess that's emasculating or whatever, but we have to be, um, um, slaves. We gotta be fucking slaves. We have to be slaves to any fucking person, any white woman who tells us what to fucking do. That's bullshit. And he smacked her. She goes, I am the boss of you. And then he was like, how does that feel? How does that feel? And he's right. He's absolutely right. She hit him and that's acceptable because an adult can fucking hit a kid. Bullshit. That kid is vulnerable and innocent and you're not a good fucking parent if you're smacking your kid around. You should be protecting your kids and making them strong. That's what Emil says for the first 12 years. You give them freedom because humans are good and society corrupts them. So you got to protect that goodness and make them strong, capable, smart in what they can do. And that way society won't exploit them and, and corrupt them. The society won't corrupt the goodness of the kid if you protect that goodness. 
So, yeah, black women, you need to, need to read some Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You need to check out a meal. You need to stop hitting your kids and, and let it go. Let it go. You can't control the world. Control yourself. You can control how you react to other people, but you're not the queen of anybody else. You're not the boss over anybody else. You know, you can feel like a queen or a princess and feel pretty and, and um, you know, important, and that's fine. But if you're trying to raise your kids to actually be meaningful uh, participants in this culture or in this society, if you just fucking making them little, your bitches all the fucking time, time, you're little slaves, you're going to make them to where they get manipulated by everybody all the rest of their lives for the till the day they die. Till the day they fucking die. Do you really fucking hate your kid that much that you're going to fucking hit them, manipulate them, and shit all of them, so that way when they do go everywhere else, they'll be fucking manipulated and treated like an asshole? Is that what you want? I, I think you should relax. I think you should let go. And I, I in fact, I told my mother this. She's got some a lot of these traits. Um, and it is old school type of bullshit, okay? But that's how the white mass control the black people. The white mass control black people through violence. So why would you do the exact same thing? You're going to whip the kid through violence. Do as I say, right? Fucking tend my garden and shit. Um, but it's a little bit different with me because I was actually on the, on the farm and in the field. But I said, if you can't let go, give them wiggle room, you know? How are you going to ride a bike if you can't get on the bike and fall down a couple times? You know, you got to have some wiggle room. If you're, there's no air around you, if you're just a goddamn absolute fucking monarch, you're fucking your kids up more than anybody else out here. And I bet that's a big fucking issue with black folks. Maniac McGee. <laughs> okay. The Cobras were standing at Hector Street. Hector Street was the boundary between the East and West Ends, or to put it another way, between the Blacks and Whites. Not that you never saw a White in the East End or a Black in the West End. People did cross the line now and then, especially if they are adults and it was daylight. This is like Louisville on Nice Street. Uh, somebody actually suggested, I don't, I'm not going to say any of this, but the, well, I will. They suggested about actually if you want to stop a crime, then uh, you put a, a fucking wall around the West End. And then someone says that the crime rate goes up the farther you get away from the Ninth Street. And I've heard like this shit before, and I don't like when white racists say that type of shit. But I got robbed fucking twice in the West End. Yeah, there's black racists out there who will fuck you over because they think you're fucking Ivy League fucking, you know, country club fucking elite. Or because they want your shit and they'll rationalize it in any fucking way. They've been fucking us, so who gives a shit? Let's just fuck people over because that's who we are as humans. Us black people are fucking shitty. And they want to sit there and say, oh, you're not black. But I guess the black dude who's smoking crack and robbing motherfuckers and killing people, oh, he's solidly black. Oh, he's 100% black, right? And this is in Liz Jones' class. I don't remember the lady's name. It was a student in her class, so it wasn't Liz Jones. Um, but yeah, yeah, you know, you're going to sit there and fucking say, you know, take away my fucking identity. And yet, uh, basically, it seems like who black people are, it's almost like a race to the bottom. Uh, they said Barack Obama's not black enough, right? He comes from Africa, so or his uh, father was an African black, so therefore he's not an American black that had to go through slavery and shit like that. Well, he's had to experience a lot of the things that black folks have experienced here in this culture. You know, he couldn't hail a taxi. They would ignore him and, you know, shit like that. So, the, um, the, the, Barack Obama's not black enough to be the fucking president, but the crackhead, the fucking thieving, fucking murdering, fucking low-life piece of shit that is absolute fucking garbage for anybody. Um, I, I've actually had good conversations with... Um, you know, a black friend of mine, and basically it seems like in any group of people, you're just going to have shitty fucking people in any fucking group, right? And probably 50% of all fucking groups are just fucking crap, right? And, um, and, and so that's, you know, there is an article I read that says that it was kind of a race to the bottom. Barack Obama wasn't black enough, but whereas uh, fucking, you know, he's black as fuck, right? You, you, Barack Obama sold out, right? He went white. He's acting white. Oh, look at Barack. He's acting white. He sold out. So, basically, to be black, you just gotta be a fucking punk-ass fucking piece of shit. You gotta walk all fucking stupid, and you gotta fucking gangbang, and fucking shoot people, and murder people, and rob people, and fucking treat everybody like assholes. Then then you're 100% black. Oh, you're you're definitely black. Then get a cop to beat you up, go to jail, right, for 30 years. Then you're black. Oh, you're you're 100% in the black community there. Then you're, you know, you're, you're one of us, FUBU, right? Um, so... That's um that's that's quite unfortunate if that's the case. That culture sort of needs to be broken also too. So carried on. Um the West End and the East End. Whites on uh the East End and black uh, oh yeah, no, blacks on the East End and whites on the West End. So it's actually the opposite. And the West End of Louisville is predominantly black and the East End is predominantly white. So people did cross the line now and then, especially if they're adults and it was daylight, but nighttime, 
Forget it. If you're a kid, day or night, forget it. Unless you had business on the other side, such as sports team or school, don't be just strolling along as if you belonged there, as if you weren't afraid, as if you didn't even notice you were a different color from everybody around you. The Cobras were laughing because they figured the dumb, scraggly runt would get out of the East End in about as good shape as a bare big toe in a convention of snapping turtles. This is Maniac McGee. Maniac McGee was blind, sort of. He could see objects, all right. He could see a flying football or a John McNabb fastball better than anybody else. He could see Mars Bar's foot sticking out, trying to trip him as he circled the bases for a home run. He could see Mars Bar's charging from behind to tackle him, even when he didn't have the football. He could see Mars Bar's bike veering for a nearby puddle to splash water on him. He could see these things, but he couldn't see what they meant. He couldn't see that Mars Bars disliked him, maybe even hated him. When you think about it, it's amazing all the stuff that Maniac McGee didn't see. Such as big kids don't like little kids showing them up. And big kids like it even less if another big kid, such as Hands Down, is laughing at them while the little kid is faking them out of their fruit of the looms. And some kids don't like a kid who is different, such a kid who such as a kid who is allergic to pizza which Maniac McGee was, or a kid who does dishes without being told, or a kid who never watches Saturday morning cartoons, or a kid who's another color. Maniac kept trying, but still he couldn't see it, this color business. He didn't figure he was white any more than the East Enders were black. He looked himself over pretty hard and came up with at least seven different shades and colors right on his own skin, and not one of them being what he would call white. Except for maybe his eyeballs. But they weren't any whiter than the eyeballs of the kids in the East End. Which is a big relief to Maniac. Finding out that he wasn't really white. Because the way he figured white was the most boring color of all. But there it was piling up around him. Dislike. Not from everybody, but enough. And Maniac couldn't see it. Then all of a sudden he could. And so hot... It was so hot, the fire hydrant at Green and Chestnut was gushing like Niagara Falls, courtesy of somebody wrenching off the cap. By the time Maniac and the rest of the vacant lot regulars got there, Chestnut and Green was a cross between the block party and the swimming pool. Radios blaring, people blaring, somebody selling lemonade, somebody selling Kool-Aid ice cubes on two picks, bodies, skins, colors, water, gleaming, buttery, warm, cool, wet, screaming, happy. The younger you were, the fewer clothes you had on. Grown up sat on the sidewalk and dangled their bare feet in the running gutters. Teenagers stripped down to bathing suits and cutoffs. Little kids underwear, littlest kids, nothing. Maniac danced and pranced and screamed with the rest. He learned how to jump in front of the gusher and let it propel him halfway across the street. He joined in a snake dance. He got goofy. He dressed himself in all the wet and warm and happy. Uh, when he first heard the voice, he didn't think much of it. Just one voice. One voice in a hundred. But then the other voices were falling away in bunches until only this one was left. It was a strange voice, deep and thick and sort of clotted as though it had to fight its way through a can of worms before coming out. The voice was behind him saying the same word over and over, calling a name. And even then, Maniac turned only because he was curious, wondering what everybody was staring at. But when he saw the brown finger, finger pointing at him, not a speck of icing on it. And the brown arm that aimed it and the brown face behind it, he knew the name coming out of the can of worms mouth was his, Whitey. And it surprised him that he knew. He just stood there blinking through the water. Drop sun blur, the hydrant gusher smacking his thin bare ankles. The radios of people were silent. You move on now, Whitey, the man said. You pick up your gear and you move on now. Time to go home now. The man was close enough to be catching some water around his shoes when Maniac McGee noticed were actually slippers. His pa pants were baggy and his shirt wasn't really a shirt but a pajama top covered with high-tailed roosters. White hair, hair curled around his ears. Maniac gave his answer, I am home. The man took a step closer, dropped his arm. You go home now, son. Back to your own kind. I seen you at the black party. Now you get going. Maniac stepped out of the gusher. The water rolled roared onto the opposite curb. This is where I live. I live right down there. He pointed towards Sycamore. The man didn't seem to notice. Never enough, is it, Whitey? Just always one more and more. We can't even, won't even uh, leave us our own little water on the street. Come on now. Come on down to see Bojangles. Come on to the zoo, the monkey house. He must have been hard of hearing, Maniac thought, so he called it out really loud and slow and pointed again. I live at 728 Sycamore. I do. The old man stepped closer. You got your own kind. It's how you wanted it. Now, let's keep it that way. You move on. Your kind's waiting. He flung his finger westward. Up there. Suddenly, Hester and Lester were by Maniac's side, barking at the man. You leave him alone, old rag picker. You shut up. And the man was croaking, ranting, not to Maniac now, but to the people. What happens when we go over there? Black is black, white is white. The sheep lie not with the lion. 
Right, the, the sheep lie not with the white and black is black white is white what happens when we go over there the sheep knows where his own kind his own kind a woman was rushing in then pulling him away up the street our own kind our own kind the water thundered across the silent street maniac McGee who was one of the world's great sleepers couldn't sleep well that night or the next the Mac McNabb boys didn't know whom they did expect maniac to bring to the party but one thing for sure they did not expect him to come walking through the front door at the black kid. That was only half of it. From the way the kid swaggered in from the candy bar that jutted like a chocolate stogie from the corner of his mouth from the rip stone evil scowl in his face, the kid had to be none other than Mars Bar Thompson himself. If black meant bad, if black meant in your face nastiness, if black meant as far from white as you could get, then Mars Bar Thompson was the blackest of the black.